copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Oakland police calling all cars, attention all cars, wanted for murder. A man described as follows. Medium bill, has black hair, blue eyes. approximately 10,000 miles during 1937. Police cars of Los Angeles will each travel 80,000 miles during 1937. Any kind of gasoline will get you over 10,000 miles if you buy enough of it, but any kind of gasoline will not give you the remarkable performance police cars get. Rio Grande Crack is the gasoline of police car performance. Los Angeles police cars have used it exclusively year after year. This is likewise true of Oakland, Berkeley, Fresno, Santa Barbara, San Diego, Orange County, San Diego County, Maricopa County, Arizona, and many, many other cities and towns. Yes, more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment use Rio Grande Crack gasoline wherever it is sold than any other brand. This is because it is cracked into tiny atoms by the famous patented Sinclair cracking process. These broken up atoms burn more readily and more completely. You get quicker starting and greater power just as police cars do. And you need less Rio Grande Crack gasoline to travel 10,000 miles. Don't be satisfied during 1937 with slow burning, sluggish gasoline. Make it a year of flashing police car performance. Start tomorrow using Rio Grande Crack gasoline. Ask your nearest independent Rio Grande dealer. our pleasure at this time to present once again Chief Bodie Walden of the Oakland Police Department, who will speak to you from our studios at KSFO in San Francisco. Chief Walden. Good evening. Tonight, calling all cars brings you another story from the files of the Oakland Police Department. A story of one more individual who thought that he could commit a crime and get away with it. That he was wrong, you will hear for yourself a little later. Right now, I would like to point out how vitally important it is for you, as citizens, to cooperate with your police force in every way. A great many people have the idea that a policeman... If just a man with a badge, he stands on the corner lying in wait to give you a ticket for parking. A man who has nothing better to do than to direct you to the curb when you violate some traffic law and give you a citation to appear in court. And you don't like it. You feel angry about it. But if you stop and reflect, didn't you feel just the same way about your instructor in school? Yet now that you're out of school, you realize your lessons were very valuable after all. The point that I am trying to bring out tonight is the policeman is a person who dedicates his life to advise and protect you. When he stops, questions, or arrests you, it's because you're doing something that may endanger your own life or property or that of someone else's life, limb, or property. He is performing his sworn duty as a peace officer. So when you think of the police, think of them not as your enemies, but as your friends. In closing, may I say, good night, and a happy and prosperous new year to all. September 1934. Patrolman O'Brien of the Oakland Police Department, detailed to the city park, walks a leisurely beat along the edge of a small pool filled with water lilies. To his way of thinking, this is the perfect day. Warm, clear, nothing to worry about, more than keeping people off the ground. 
But as he rounds the turn in the winding park pathway, he hears a strangely discordant note. The sound of a child sobbing. His curiosity aroused, but Coleman O'Brien decides to investigate. Here, here, here now. What's all this crying about, young fella? Now, now, now. Hold on a minute. This is no way for a big lad like you to be carrying on. Where's your mother? You don't know. Then then you must be lost, is that it? Oh, well, well, now, now, come on now. You'll never find him this way. Now, now, I'll tell you what. You, you'll be after stopping that car in there, and, and, and I'll take you to look for your daddy. He'll probably be around here somewhere. Oh, well, nevertheless, I, I think we can find him all right. That is, if, if you'll stop that car, and help me look for him. Oh, hey, hey, who are you here? Is that any way to ask? You say all right in the beginning to listen to you. And I say, now, wait a minute here. You just say, hey, what's this on your back? Well, for the love of a note. Been down here with the safety, friend. Now, 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 hold still here, young fellow, till I get this off and see what it says. My God, this poor boy. Ah, he did, eh? Ah. Ronald Tanner, 2326 Tellville Road. Is that your name? Ronald? Huh. And your daddy turned it down and went away. Well, I, I, I'll tell you what I, I'd better do, Ronald. I, I think we'll uh, take a walk over here to the patrol box and, and phone the sergeant about this. Maybe he can help find your daddy. How's that? All right, good enough. Uh, and, and, and if the sergeant says so... Maybe you'll get a ride in the police car. Now, how'd you like that? There. <laughs> yeah. All right, then. Dry your eyes and let's get going. I will. And as a result of the phone call, little Ronald does get a ride in a police car. Driving him to the address found on him, the radio car officers finding no one home and decide to leave him in the yard where his parents will find him upon the return home. Then, after reporting into the station, they resume their patrol. Late the same afternoon, George Soderberg, a reporter on the Oakland Tribune, his photographer companion Edward Rogers, hearing of the lost child incident, decide to go out and tell the road address and get a human interest on. But when they arrive there, they are met with a strange scene. Three small children huddled on the front porch. A girl of 11, a boy of about six, and little Ronald, the reason for their being there. Looks like a reception committee, Ed. Yeah, maybe the other two heard we were going to shoot pictures and hurried over. Always a sunny guy, keep on. Why not? Maybe you got something there at that. Come on, let's see what the huddle's about. Okay. Where are your parents? I don't know. Is this little Ronald? Yes. How did you know his name? Well, I'll tell you what. If I tell you how I knew now Ronald's name, can we shoot a picture of him? What for? For the papers. Oh. Well, could you tell me where Mommy and your Daddy are? Oh, I'm afraid not. You see, that's what we came out here for. To see them and to get a story about Ronald having been lost in the park. Lost in the park? When? Today. He, uh, he was found there with a note pinned on him with his name and address on it. That's how we came to know about him. But, but where's Mommy then? Or Daddy? This is beginning to sound like a Chinese puzzle, George. You tell it. Look, little girl, who are you? Francis Tanner. Ronald's my little brother. And this little man is your brother, too? Mm-hmm. That's Bobby. Now, maybe you'd better tell us where you came from uh, this afternoon. It's a movie. A daddy came to school and he gave me 50 cents and told me to take Bobby to his show. He said he didn't want us to come home for lunch either to get it at school. So you went to a movie and then what happened? Well, we came home and, and found Ronald here in the yard all alone. He was crying. Well, what was he crying about? That's just all right. Oh, he talked. What did you expect, a sign language? I found a note on the door that it didn't say where Mommy was. Did he got it? Yes, sir. It's still on the door there. Now, wait a minute, Sir. I think what it says. Gone for the day. It's a great help. Gone for the day. Something we didn't know. Look, Ed, I think you'd better see if we can get into the house and make a look around. It's getting too cold outside for these kids anyway. All right, with me, it's too cold for even a photographer. 
If you have this money in... Mm, we'll do our best, young lady. You just try to keep Ronald under control, and Mr. Rogers and I will show you the fix of help breaking. Right, Edward? Correct. Now, the first thing to do is try the door. See if it's locked, you know. Which I take it is. Right. Now, if I were a fireman, I might be tempted to use an axe on the door, but not being a fireman, I won't. Look, George, uh, what would you think about skipping the narrative and just sort of getting in the house, huh? Oh, you don't like my little lecture. No, I don't. All right, I'm not so fond of it myself. Come on, let's look around by the back door. If it's locked, then I think you might be justified in removing it from the scene. Yeah, sure, anything you say. Only will you stop sounding like a reporter trying to write a novel and get underway, I'm beginning to turn to ice. <laughs> Accordingly, the two men, accompanied by three small figures, make a complete journey around the house, buying windows, doors, anything that might afford a means of entrance. And finally, as a last resort, they decide to unhinge the back door. That's done it. Set it down over here. Now, let's see what we can do about making the place warm. I don't know where the lights turn on, mister. Good. Suppose you need to go in and turn them on. Sure. Well, exactly. I got a funny idea. These kids are on the raw end of a family walk out That's because you're a reporter. Probably find they took a drive and had a flat tire or something. Matter of fact, we'll probably get shot as burglars. Here they are. You can come in now. Okay. Thanks. Come on, Ed. Say, what in the name of all this? Uh, is this the way your house always looks? Oh, yes, sir. I never saw everything all upset like this. My mom is up to me always. Well, look, you better stay back here with your brothers while we take a look. Take a look in the front. No. Oh. Uh, I'll tell you later. Will you do that for me now? Oh. All right. Come on. Hmm. Exactly. When you look at the furniture, all shelves around looks like an earthquake is stuck. Only unless I miss my guess considerably, it wasn't an earthquake. It did this. Hey, what are you driving at, George? I've got a funny feeling there's been a sweet battle of some sort in here. I've had that feeling ever since we stepped in the house. Something screwy in Denmark. Hey, we ought to call the police? Yeah. We'd better do that first thing and then take a good look around. And listen, Ed, we've got to keep those kids out of here. I may be all wet for them, just in case I'm not. Yeah, I know what you mean. Let's call the station. <laughs> Rogers contact Chief Wallman of the Oakland Police. Tells him of their discovery. And a short time later, Police Inspectors Evans and Summers arrive at the Delta Road address. Are met by Carterberg and Rogers, who, while waiting, have uncovered some interesting things. When we called the inspector, it was only on a hunch because of the furniture's condition and all. But since then, I've looked around, and now I'm sure something's wrong. Oh. Well, in the first place, there were about three... T- in the first place, there were about three... T- in the first place, there were about three cases here on the floor where someone had tried to remove some kind of stain to the wet cloth. See? No, but a thorough job of cleaning. Hmm. That's what I thought. Probably whoever did it was in a hurry. Yeah. Now, here's the baby that made me sure of everything. Green height. Just about right for the blackjack. And if you look closely, I think you can see some dried blood on the end there. See? It sure looks like it all right. Now, if you're satisfied that someone's been hurt around here, I'll tell you why I think it's a murder. Murder? Yeah, a murder. Come here. Over here by the bed. You see what's behind it? For sure. Small closet. Unless my education's been sadly neglected. Closets are, are closets aren't usually nailed shut, and this one is. The two nice new shiny nails. Hey, did you push this bed up against the door, or was it that way? It was just like it is now. Shoved up tight against the closet. Well, it looks like the thing to do now is to look inside and see what's there. Right. I got a claw hammer. Pick it up so to have it ready when you arrive. Good. Yeah. Let's have it. Here you are. Hey, you better push that bed out of the way so we can get at it. Yeah. Uh, all right, I'll make a hole here. Push it oh, yeah. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. I can get at these nails now. This is bad enough to kick over the nails. Yeah. yeah. That's got it. Now. Oh, no. A woman. You mean it was a woman. It hasn't been very long since she was killed either. Summer, you better get to a phone. Get an ambulance out. And tell Chief Wellman about it, right? Come on, Soderberg. You show me where those kids are. I want to talk to them. 
After a brief talk with the Tanner girl, interrupted at intervals by Ronald's repeated message about his daddy going away, Evans and Soderberg feel certain that the person responsible for the vicious flaying can be no other than the children's father, Lewis Tanner. Armed with this theory, Evans... As far as I can see, Chief, everything fits perfectly. The kid Ronald being left in the park by his father, the other two kids being told not to come home and given 50 cents. Everything points to this Tanner is the one we want. Yeah, sounds logical enough. Now, even the time element works out right. If Tanner did it, he wouldn't want his kid around, so, so he makes certain that they stay at school for lunch and go to a movie after school in the afternoon. And Ronald, that's the youngest one, Ronald, he leaves out in the yard while he does the job inside. No, Ronald and beats it. All right, boys. We've done a good job of reconstruction. Now, all we've got to do is to find Tanner. You got any ideas along that line? Not yet, Chief. And the first thing you'd better do is to check the files and see if he has a past record. Meanwhile, I'm going to have Inspector Goodnight check with every police bureau for the same thing. If we don't get anything that way, we'll have to start from scratch, and that means plenty of work. Thus, within 12 hours of the crime, every available bit of police machinery is set into motion. Every police identification bureau in the United States notified and set for the record. And in less than 36 hours, Chief Wallman begins to get results. Oakland Police, regarding the bulletin number 25543, Lewis Tanner arrested here in November 1912 with stowaway, fined five pounds or seven days. This is the only record we have, New Zealand Police. Oakland Police, fined record. One Lewis Tanner as follows. December 1912, arrested here in Stowaway. Found ten pounds of four weeks of hard labor. Took four weeks. It's only record we have of him under that name. Newcastle Police. I found a record on Tanner, Chief Woman. Pretty well since it out here, too. Good. What is it? On August 8th of this year, he tried to attack his wife with a butcher knife, and she had him thrown in jail here. Then she changed her mind. Got him out on bail, and he forfeited it. That was only last month. Oh, she gets him out on bail and he turns around and murders her. My business. He's got a good description of him on the booking clip. Planted. it. Him? Yes, sir? Get Tanner's description from the files and have circulars printed and sent out to every possible point. Yes, sir. Also, you'd better teletype the description to every police station and ask the head to issue it to every one of their men with orders to arrest and hold for us if located. <laughs> of the wanted man and a thin lead to his habit, Chief Wallerman issues precise orders to his assistant. Keeps the manhunt running smoothly, efficiently. Out to every police substation, to every sheriff's office in the country, goes a circular reading wanted for murder, Lewis Tanner, 51 years of age, medium build, black hair, blue eyes, weight approximately 150. They found the rest, hold and notify Oakland police immediately. the Oakland harbor front, Inspectors Evans and Summers with a squad of six men mingled with a crowd of sailors, laborers, stevedores. Even a less watch for the sign of their father, wife killer, Lewis Tanner. There is much chance to spot him in this mob and have him walk in and get himself up. Yeah, especially when he knows we should looking for him right now and he's probably disguised himself in some way. Well, doesn't do any harm to look around. Might get lucky all of a sudden. Yeah, you need just to be different, eh? Something like that. Hey, what did they do with the kids? Took them over to the juvenile hall. I guess that's where they'll have to stay for a while. They're all too young to take care of themselves. And uh, tough start for the kids. One of them murdered, and now they're put away for doing it. That is, provided we catch him. Yeah. It keeps me how anyone could be such a thief to do a thing like that. People don't think about those things when they get the idea to murder someone. Yeah, maybe they don't then. But if they think about it plenty later on. Well, it shouldn't really do any good to anybody to talk about it now. The kids will get the best of everything up there, and that's about the only thing anybody can do for them. Yeah, I guess it's a pretty tough break to start out with just the same. Say, listen, I've got a hunch we're wasting our time here. Let's leave the boys to come to the harbor, and you and I take a run up to that WCA camp. This little girl told us her father worked there. Well, listen, you don't think he'd be nuts enough to go back there, do you? No. Only I'd like to see what the foreman of the place knows about it. Come on, let's get out of here. For me? You're the foreman of this camp. We are. Well, you come to the right person, all right. 
My name's Harvey. Inspector Evans, the Oakland Police, Mr. Harvey. This is Inspector Summers. Uh, what's, uh, what's the matter? Something wrong? Priests don't usually pay calls on this camp. Oh, we're just checking up on the man who works for you, Louis Tanner. You know him? Tanner? Sure, sure. I know him, all right. Well, he isn't around here today, is he? No. Matter of fact, he didn't show up at all this morning. Funny, too, on the camp. He's uh, most of the time right here on the job. He must be sick or something. Well, now, that's too bad. He sort of hopes to have a little chat with him. Of course, if he's sick. Well, I guess we'll have to make it another time. He, he wasn't looking for him for any particular reason, was he? No, just wanted to talk to him. But if he shows up, you might give us a call at the police station. Just say that Ken is back to work and he'll get the message. Sure, sure, sure thing. I imagine he'll be back tomorrow or so. Oh, fine. And incidentally, uh, you don't have to mention the fact that we were here. Mm. That is, in case he does come back. Yeah. We want to surprise him. That right, Summers? Huh? Oh, sure. Yeah, that's right. Surprise him. Well, then... Uh, I'll let you know when he comes back. That's fine. Come on, yeah. Thomas. Let's get back to town. Well, so long. Come back sometime when I can the place. Hey, what's the idea of playing James with that old bird, Evan? Telling him that we didn't want Tanner for any particular reason. Just an idea. Thought maybe if we kept him in the dark, he might possibly know where Tanner was and let us know. Oh, we can never tell when people are going to do funny things. However, I don't think anything will come of this trip. Come on, let's jump off. Okay, what's stopping us? <laughs> So it goes, hour after hour, place after place, and no sign is found of a missing killer. Suspects are picked up by alert policemen in every city, questioned, turned loose again when they have proved their identity. Hours stretch on into the beginning of the second day. Each tiny lead is run down before being discarded. And as the second day gives way tonight, Lewis Tanner is still at large. All that night and the following week, outbound ships are searched from stem to stern for stowaways, answering the description of the hunted man. And although many ships devote their human cargo for inspection, Tanner is not among any of them. It is nearly two years later. In Oakland, the once indignant citizens have forgotten the brutal Tanner slaying. Newspapers have long since switched the focus of their attention to other things, to the news of the day. Only the open police force still remember the crime and continue their efforts towards finding their man. Efforts have begun to seem futile as the months drag by. And in Seattle, Washington, Teddy Swanson, 13-year-old preacher youth, and a young companion trudge wearily along a windswept street. Coats buttoned high against the bite of a bitter cold February night. Their thoughts run to the far off summer of more fishing. Around the corner near Eddie's home, they pass one of the many straggling lines of human gallery, waiting for a free handout in the red line. In the glare from an overhead street lamp, haggard faces reflect their owner's thoughts. Eyes stare ahead at nothing. Fascinated by the sight, Eddie stands his face in turn. His thirteen-year-old imagination painting multicolored pictures in his mind. Suddenly he stops. Gazes for an instant at a face that seems vaguely familiar. Eyes for playful. Failing to do so, he resumes his walking and a few blocks later reaches his own home. As he starts from the door, his memory suddenly flashes a message, galvanizes his body into instant action. Oh, don't worry, sir. I'm right. 
You see, I'm a detective, too. Oh. Only not like you. I am got a bag. Well, if this is the right man, we'll see what we can do about that. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Swanson, amateur sleuth, Captain Yoder finds himself running through the wind swept streets, wondering if perhaps he isn't the victim of a useful prank. But at last, they reach the bread line, and after a moment's hesitation, Eddie points a thin finger at one man, then points back to the picture. You see? Yeah, I see all right. Did what I wear? Oh, far from it, son. You get it right on the nose. Listen to me carefully. I want you to stay right here in the shadow. I walk up to this man, watch what happens. And if anything goes wrong, you speed it back as fast as your legs will carry him to the station and tell the sergeant. Understand? Yes, sir. You think he might try to get away? Well, I think there's a very good chance of it. So you stay over here. Now, those are orders. Understand? Yes, sir. Okay. Here you go. Your hands. What? You heard me. Stick out your hands and make it. Hey, wait a minute. Mr. I guess you're a cop from the looks of you. You haven't got anything on me. There's nothing to make me stick my hands. Listen, Tanner. I'm telling you once more to stick out your hands and be quiet. And this is the last time I'm going to. Oh, please. What have I got to worry about? It? Well, you can't frame anything on me. I don't have to. You've already framed yourself. Now, you're going to walk back to the station quietly with me, or do I have to drag you? Suit yourself. I'll walk. Good. That's the first smart thing you've done yet. Come on. But once back in Captain York's office, the man denies all knowledge of the crime, denies his name, his tanner, denies him everything, and Captain York continues to throw questions at him. Well, if your name isn't Tanner, you're not from Oakland, then who are you? That doesn't make any difference. My name's not Tanner. How do you explain this picture of you in the detective magazine? I don't. How do you explain this bulletin I found in our files with a description of you in it marked wanted for murder? That's not me. How long do you think you can get away with this bluff, Tanner? I'm not bluffing. Then what's your name and where do you live? I don't know. I can't think with all these questions. You don't have to think to tell me. I don't. You I don't. don't. If you're lying, I don't. You don't what? I don't. I don't remember. Your name is Tanner, is it? Yes. No, it's just it's Tanner. Lewis Tanner. And you murdered your wife and left your three kids deserted in Oakland. Didn't you? Yes. Yes, I did. I, I can't stand any more questions. I don't want a piece of pipe. I'm sorry I couldn't help it. I have to tell her. So as Tanner was returned to Oakland, where he signed a full confession of the brutal crime. On April 22nd, 1936, he was convicted of murder by a jury of seven men and women. Two weeks later, Judge Frank M. Ogden of Alameda County sentenced him to the death penalty. An appeal to the California Supreme Court was denied in October, sealing the death warrant for Lewis Tanner murdering. And Eddie Swanson, the 13-year-old boy responsible for the arrest, was awarded the sum of $100 for his alertness. So ends the case of Oakland's heinous murder. No matter what the age or make of your motor car, it deserves a thick and lubrication. Resolve to give it the finest you can buy during 1937. Resolve to use only Sinclair motor oil conducive. Go to your nearest independent Rio Grande dealer and ask for Sinclair Pennsylvania or Sinclair Opaline, two of the most completely de waxed, de jellied motor oils you can buy. And if you haven't tried Rio Grande cracked gasoline, you have a pleasant surprise in store for you. This quicker starting, faster accelerating, greater mileage gasoline will give you a new conception of performance, police car performance. That flashing type of performance the police cars, fire engines, and ambulances of Los Angeles, Oakland, and many, many other cities and counties get in their emergency equipment. Important changes in Calling All Cars radio schedules are explained in Calling All Cars News. Get a free copy tomorrow from your independent Rio Grande dealer. Broadcast 162. Sergeant Man wanted for murder. That's the stage now in custody. That's all. Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night, 
for the Rio Grande Oil Company. 